Okay, here we are again today to talk about a letter two of Valentin Tomberg's Meditations in the Tarot. Let's begin with his epigraph. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up her seven pillars. In Proverbs 9.1. And this is, uh, well, a direct reference, but also this, this entire letter is, uh, bears an implicit sociology. Uh, he gets more explicit with his sociology later in, in the book. But here, it's really, really implied, and it's implied all over the place, actually. Um, and before we go on, I just want to show you something. Here's my book. And you can see that I colored all of the, 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 the cards as, as they're depicted in the book. They're just line drawings. And I don't know where I got this idea 20 years ago or so. I'd been studying the book for a while, and I thought, maybe I should just color it, make it my own. I mean, it's not really my own with all of my underlinings, and you can see my, my gazillions of uh, tabs that I stuck in the book. But I thought, might as well color it, too. <laughs> just go, go the whole way. So, uh, so I, I recommend it, too. It was, it was a re really a wonderful experience. Um, but to return to, our, to the card, to the high priestess. Now, as I share these, these thoughts with you throughout this lecture series, you know, these are not to be thought of the thoughts that I am not absolutely explicating forever and for all time meditations on the tarot, because that's not how it works. All I'm doing is sharing with you some of the things that I have noticed, like I, would, like a t like a, I do as a professor. I, I share things with the students. I don't tell them what things mean. I just share things that I noticed. And I'm sure they notice things I don't, and which is, which is what's important about it. Why it's, why it's a, a wonderful text, because you can study a text over and over again. And for thousands of years, people can study it. And, you know, college freshmen can look at it and see things that no one has ever seen before, but that are really there. That's you know, a wonderful thing about the life of the mind. So, but let's let's talk about the things I found interesting in this this reading, and I, I have to say probably uh, that I noticed more now than I have in my other readings through the text is uh, Tomberg's emphasis on gendered typology, or as, we, or as the words in the words of Genesis, male and female created he them. And it's not always explicit, but it's it's uh, it's really present in this idea of duality that he that he talks about. And now, and I don't mean dualism because he refutes dualism, but the union of two is how he describes it. Uh, this union of two. What are the two that are be, to be unified? Well, there are lots of different things. Um, part of the things he one of the, he says here. Uh, he talks, the, uh, this is on page 30, or close into the beginning. The breath of the spirit, or the pure, pure act of intelligence, is certainly, is certainly an event, but it does not suffice itself alone for us to become conscious of it. Consciousness, conscience, is the result of two principles, the active, activating principle and the passive reflecting principle. And what he's talking about is the active principle he sees... Uh, symbolized in the magician card where the magician is standing he's at work he's manipulating things uh, and that's a very according to the way Tom Briggs thinking a masculine attribute you know trying to be traditionally masculine and meditations on the tarot is nothing if not a, a handbook of traditionalism in a sense you know I mean a, a kind of doctrinaire traditionalism that gets it's a little paranoid and bunkerish. I mean, you know, a kind of Christian tradition. How we, how the Christian tradition sees things and what the reasons are. And so, 
So the magician is this active principle, male. The high priestess is reflective, female. You can even think about this in sexual archetypes, right? You know, the male generative organs are on the outside of the body. Men pursue, women receive. You know, they receive, and their their generative organs are the inside of their body, and they take, they take from the male within, right? They receive, they're receptive, and this is what the the high priestess is in, in a, we can say, in a spiritual sense. You know, she's receptive in that way. She's seated. This is a point Tomberg makes, right? She is seated in a receptive mode, which doesn't mean that she's not doing anything. Reception is still an activity, but it's a different kind of activity. Now, he also points to the magician as symbolic or emblematic of mysticism. But mysticism is no good unless it can be reflected upon, which is what uh, the high priestess does. And then he points out that she's, she's holding a book. So this... So you can you can think so magician mysticism acts or right? it's an activity it's a it's a push the gnosis represented by the high priestess receives contemplates the experience and then as we'll find out a little bit in this chapter but more in the, in the, in the next uh, with the empress that the magical act of projection follows this now could say projection in different ways. Projection, say, in uh, in the sexual context, is the projection is the child created by the union of man and woman. Artistically, the the, the projection is the work of art, the poem, the work of music, whatever it happens to be. And then the last stage, uh, which. Um, corresponds for Tomberg to hermetic philosophy in the card the emperor is the book is when it becomes uh, something even more incarnated than the artwork so if we to, to stick with the artwork but if I tell this to my students in creative writing a lot that you know writing a poem or writing anything is an incarnational act. So, you, you, the poem, as, it's, as it is right now, before you write it, is a spiritual activity. It's a spiritual thing. It exists in potential, but it has to incarnate. It has to take on a body. And it takes on a body, you could, nowadays through typing, but also through a pen, right? And it's projected onto the paper, and it becomes a thing. I always think this is part of the, the reason uh, um, internet artworks and and even poems to a lesser degree, but artworks especially, and even music, even though they can be moving, are not the same thing as being there with someone's playing the music or someone you're seeing you're seeing the Pieta, for instance, or or any work of art in person. It's a different experience. Um, I remember when I, when I was in my 20s, I went to the Tate Gallery in, in London, and I had studied William Blake and had all these books of Blake's il illustrations and illuminated copies of, of his, you know, uh, manuscripts of his, uh, not manuscripts, but illuminated versions of his, his books in manuscript, you know, color copies, but they're copies. But you saw, I saw the real thing. <laughs> I had to sit down for a minute because it was... A profoundly moving experience to see the the real documents that created by his hands, and but that's it's an incarnational process. I tell the students, right? So the poem takes on a body when you write it down, and then after the poem, and that's the projection, the magical act, right? It's projected out. It's like a child. I have nine kids, you know. They each have a life of their own. I can't control them. Believe me, I can't control them. So, but they're out and they, they have a life of their own, but they, but they, they formed in their mother's womb the union between their, their mother and myself. But, but they're projected out, they have lives of their own, but then the, the hermetic 
act or the act of hermetic philosophy is you need to see what it all means, right? To put it into a, a wider context. And that's what hermetic philosophy is. Um, looking at, at, at all these stages and, and doing something with it, completing the act. It's really a complete act. And I would say, with my, in my own work, for instance, I can say that I spent, I don't know how many years, writing poetry. And that was always reluctant to publish a book. When I finally did publish a book in 2014 or 15, and that was the projection. But then I felt after that that I didn't, you know, as much as I still wanted to write poetry and still do write poetry, that I needed to figure out what poetry is, or at least what poet, what I'm trying to say what poetry is. And that's that instigated to a degree uh, the submerged reality when I wrote that, but also my book, The Incarnation of Poetic Word, that is really all about this, my philosophy of poetry. And so for me, that is writing the book after the projection, after the mysticism, which is the inspiration of the poetry, the gnosis, you know, the, the contemplation of the thing as we're working on, as I really get into an interesting place, any poet or creative person will tell you the pr process of creating it. And then when you project it, you know, that's got its, it's on its own then. You almost don't have a relationship with it anymore once it's, once it's written. People have mentioned, hey, I really like that poem of yours, such and such. And I'm, <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> you kind of forget about them, you know, because you're not involved with them. You know, you're, it's the project that you're working on that you're involved with, right? That's the gnosis getting to know it. So anyway, so, so here's uh, Tomberg uh, affirming this gender typology, but he's, he's affirming it uh, in this hermetic sense of the reintegration of consciousness. The reintegration of consciousness. This is what the, the, ta the task is, and that for him what uh, the high priestess uh, to some profound degree represents. So what do we mean by this? Well, he says on page 31, he says, the rebirth from water and spirit, which the master indicates to Nicodemus, and this is in John 3, is the reestablishment of the state of consciousness prior to the fall, where the spirit was divine breath and where this breath was reflected by virginal nature. This is Christian yoga. Right, so before I talk about Christian yoga too much, but this is it, reintegrated consciousness. It's an, he says it's analogous to the birth or historical incarnation of the word. Right? What does that mean for us as hermetic philosophers? Well, it means tr through these, these acts of mysticism, gnosis, magic, philosophy, but especially the first two, you, one's consciousness, is, I wouldn't say purified, but you get glimpses of the pre-fallen state of consciousness. I, I'll often say in sophiology, and I think it's perfectly a great description, I think this is also what Tom Burke's getting at here, this is, sophio this is sophiology, that well, I always say that sophiology it does a couple different things. One thing it tries to do, or it does, when properly activated, I guess, is it gives us a glimpse of pre-fallen nature. That's what shines through nature as given, or the poem as given, or liturgy as given. There's something, there's something behind it. And Robert Flood, for instance, the hermetic philosopher, 17th century, he makes a lot of fuss about the, the light of the first day as opposed to the light of the, of the fourth day, when the sun and the moon are created. You know, when God says, let there be light, that's a different light than the sun and the moon and the stars. And that it's that, it's that, that light of the first day, which is what we glimpse in that kind of, uh, in, in that mystical insight. And the mysticism grounded then in Gnosticism or in Gnosis. 
we see that light of the first day. And uh, the other thing I say that, that sophiology does, and, and Tumber gets to, into this later in the book, especially in uh, letter number 20, that the other thing it does is it anticipates the resurrection body or the glorified body. So we can, but it doesn't have to be the glorified body of me or of, of us as individuals. I mean, we, see the, we, we see hints of the glorified body of the creation. No, hints of glor a glorified body as it shines through. And I think that what's preeminently uh, important here is Sophia as the Virgin Mary. And we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more today. But uh, with the assumption of Mary, right? She's glorified. She's glorified. So let's talk about uh, Christian yoga, what he calls Christian yoga. Now, he compares this, and it's interesting, and he, he know, knew quite a bit about uh, different forms of yoga. And what's Christian yoga? Well, most people know of Vedantic or Buddhist yoga, right? Which is a spiritual practice, the, the aim of which is annihilation of the self, right? To be free from passions, to uh, liberation. Uh, now that for uh, for Tomberg and actually for anybody is antithetical to a Christian yoga or a Christian approach which is absolutely engaged with our personality. He talks about uh, those other forms of yoga being depersonalizations and they are depersonalizations. Uh, and I think it's unfortunate but it often happens in Christian monasticism, for instance, that there's a profound uh, level of depersonalization that, that can go on. And I think that's, I don't know, that's not very, it's not, not right. <laughs> it's not right. You know, because this, this, uh, this personalization, he calls it the, the gift of tears, right? Christian mystics are lovers. They, they receive the gift of tears. You know, think of the Song of Psalms, you know, which is this, this beautiful poem celebrating, uh, on the one level, marriage between a man and a woman. There's gender, gender typology again. And on the other hand, celebrating the union of the soul of man with God. I mean, it's, it's, it's an important, and it's passionate, you know, the, the, the bride in... The Song of Songs. She's she's beside herself when she can't find the bridegroom. You know, that is a good thing. That we feel incomplete without this other. And this actually goes back to uh, Plato talks about this, and Tom Rickman mentions Plato. Well, Plato in the Symposium when they're trying to decide what love is. You know, love is lack. If you love somebody, you're acknowledging a lack in yourself. You know, so, and and for Plato, right? Also, you know, the love of things of this world, right? Wonderful poem by Richard Wilmer, "Love Calls Us to the Things of This World," which he took from another great Platonist, Saint Augustine. Love calls us to the things of this world. So, you know, a love a man or a woman has for for for, his, for the other, for the spouse. You know, and even though it's not always perfect in this world, right? For Plato, that that's really the, and for Saint Augustine, that's the hunger for God. And it's it's like you know, it's a it's one that's present to us, but it's one that can be that you know can't be fulfilled until the beatific vision. But it's anticipated, and I think it's a beautiful thing. I mean, and that's Christian yoga. Right? That, that the whole being is involved and, and that in the beatific vision the, the self is not annihilated. It's united but still separate from God. It's not uh, like that kind of, I think it's a Buddhist uh, conception that, that we are we're like te almost like a test tube or in a, we're in a jar of water cast into the ocean 
and our task is to get out of the out of the jar and back into the ocean, which is God. Well, that's not Christian yoga. Christian yoga is you maintain your personality, right? And as St. Paul says, you are known. You know even as you are known, right? That's, this is, right now we look as through a glass darkly, but then face to face, and that's the beatific vision. Um, and, and this is where uh, Tom Berg, when he, when he quotes St. John, uh, it's on page, page 38, where he says, All who came before me are thieves and robbers. St. John's Gospel. And the reason for Tom Berg, for, for Christ to assert this, is that these forms of yoga are forms of knowing God that came before Christianity before the personal, before God became a person, were characterized by depersonalization. And even uh, Judaism to a degree, he would say. It was, you know, even though God was personal, he was not personal personal. You know, not like he didn't incarnate. And that's, you know, one of the scandals for, for, for Jews and, and for Greeks that of the incarnation, it's a scandal. God would take on the flesh. A stumbling block. But that's the that's Christian yoga right there. It's, it's <laughs> and that's my cat. That the Christian yoga there she goes. You know, she just ate something. It the, the Christian yoga affirms our personality in the presence of God. And not even just affirms, it's not like everything you do is okay. It's your, your personality becomes fulfilled. Your individuality becomes fulfilled in the, in the presence of God and the beatific vision. Now, uh, another thing he talks about here, and when he's talking about the, the four levels, right? mysticism, gnosis, magic, Hermetic philosophy. He also connects it to uh, the high priestess in her her posture, as seated posture, her tiara, and the book. And he and he talks about this as reflection, memory, word, and writing. Which becomes revelation and tradition, which can be more succinctly described as gnosis. Now, um, one of the things that really struck me here is in this discussion of, this is on page 40 in my book, he talks about um, the card is concerned with gnosis and not at all with science since gnosis is exactly what the card of the high priestess expresses both in its entirety and its details namely the descent of revelation and that's and you can see that from the mysticism gnosis magic and hermetic philosophy it's a descent Science, and compared to science, so science, on the contrary, begins with facts, the characters of the book of nature, and it sends from facts to laws, and from laws to principles. Gnosis is the reflection of that which is above. Science, in contrast, is the interpretation of that which is below. The last stage of gnosis is the world of facts, where it becomes fact itself, it becomes the book. The first stage of science is the world of facts when it re which it reads in order to arrive at laws and principles. Now it's interesting. I was going through this, um, thinking in terms of rhetoric, inductive and deductive reasoning. So one way you could look at it uh, that gnosis or the high priestess is the scent of revelation. It's kind of an inductive approach. It right? goes through these things and comes to a, a hermetic philosophy. But it seems to me that in this description, it's, like, it's also kind of deductive at the same time. 
because it reflects that which is above. Which is, so you have the, that which is above is the, the, t the thesis, and you work out the details. But it's kind of both ways at the same time. So it's kind of an interesting approach, whereas the science is start with what is here. And, and this is, again, uh, though he doesn't draw an, uh, a diagram of this, this is another one of Tomberg's crosses. So you have science, which works along this plane, and gnosis, which goes along this way. And he talks uh, also, um, when he talks about um, magical memory, or mythic memory, right, which goes this way, and typological memory, which can go this way. You know, and we talked about that last time, I think. And now, he also says here that, right in the same page, he's trying to get to the essence of what mysticism is. And he says, the essence of pure mysticism, mysticism is creative activity. Well, what does that mean, right? creative activity? Does it mean drawing, sketching? Writing poetry. He goes on. One becomes a mystic when one dares to elevate oneself, that is, to stand upright, then even more upright, and even more, ever more upright, beyond all created being as far as the essence of being, the divine creative fire. Concentration without effort is burning without smoke or crackling fire. On the part of the human being, it is the act of daring to aspire to the supreme reality. And this act is real and effective only when the soul is serene and the body completely relaxed, without smoke and crackling fire. So, this, this is, goes back again, this re reintegration of consciousness. The active part, which is the, the, the magician, and the, the reflective, I wouldn't say passive, reflective or receptive part, which is the high priestess. So it doesn't happen otherwise. Right? And he talks elsewhere in here, well, I won't get into it, how people who just do mysticism without grounding it in Gnosis or magic or, or hermetic philosophy are like drunkards. And we all have met these people, right? They're kind of running around having spiritual experiences everywhere, but they aren't grounded. I mean, their feet don't touch the ground. And that's, that's not Christian yoga. That's, I don't know what that is. That's floating away. <laughs> now... So speaking of creativity, actually, if you've got to read, uh, there's a really, really fine Russian philosopher. Not a lot of people read him these days, but they should. Nikolai Brajayev. And he wrote a book, I think in the 30s, called The Meaning of the Creative Act. And he's got a wonderful, thing. he has so many things to say about creativity through all of his books. You know, but I'm going to read one paragraph from The Meaning of the Creative Act for you. to see Because I think it resonates with... Uh, what Tomberg is doing here. And here he says, Creativeness is not only the struggle with sin and evil. It wills another world. It continues the work of creation. The law begins the struggle against sin and evil. The redemption finishes that struggle. But man is called to create a new and hitherto unknown world through free and daring creativeness to continue God's creation. The fundamental duality of man's nature, his belonging to two worlds, corresponds to the duality of redemption and creativeness. As a fallen being, enslaved by the results of sin and caught by the force of necessity, man must pass through the mystery of redemption. In it must, in it must restore his godlike nature, regain his lost freedom. The creative secret of being is hidden by sin. Man's creative powers are weakened by his fall. Through Christ, man's nature is redeemed and restored. He is saved from the curse of sin. The, the old man is reborn into a new creature, the new Adam. But the mystery of redemption conceals the mystery of creativeness. As a godlike being belonging to the realm of freedom, man is called to reveal his creative power. Here is the other side of man's dualistic nature, oriented toward creativeness instead of redemption. But true create creativeness is possible only through redemption. Christ became imminent in human nature, and this makes man a creator like the creator God. I often tell people that, uh, people ask why I'm a biodynamic farmer. I say, because I'm in the redemption business. You know, because the soil I work with was 
tinctured by the blood of Christ at the, at the crucifixion. So I'm in the redemption business. I'm, I'm, I'm working for the boss, right? And, and was, it was, uh, was, was, did the resurrection not happen in a garden? So, this, so we have this creativeness, right, that he's talking about. And I think it's the same kind of creativeness that Tauberg is talking about. And it doesn't mean being artsy. There's a, something else he's talking about here. And, and this is where he talks a little bit about uh, spiritual touch or intuition. And this is, this is something that is created through uh, mysticism, gnosis, magic, and hermetic philosophy. You develop spiritual touch or intuition through this. And it's not some, you know what I mean? It's not unincarnated. It's very incarnated. It's very flesh and blood, but it's, it's flesh and blood conjunct, connected to the spirit. It's an integrated. It's a reintegrated consciousness. And this happens, he would tell you, and I would tell you, through contemplation, through the contemplative act, through and not just the contemplative engagement of meditations on the tarot, but in a, a contemplative approach to everything you do. You know, it's something you have to cultivate and work on. But it's but it, that's this is the point. This is absolutely the point. Now, um, He also, you know, now if you notice in the beginning of the letter, he's talking about um, those four stages. And in the end of the letter, he talks about uh, the different works of Kabbalah, or the worlds of the Kabbalah, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the Asiatic world, the, the Yetzeratic world, the Bariatic world, and the Atsaluthic world. These di and, and well, I don't want to get into a whole thing about Kabbalah right now, but he's and, and if you know anything about the Kabbalah, those worlds are also a kind of process of incarnation. You know, Kabbalah is really it's a beautiful. Thing. I mean, I always mean to spend a lot more time studying the Kabbalah. I spent a lot of time in my twenties, early thirties, studying it, but it's really beautiful because it's very incarnational. You know, and you can tell, you can see why the Christian uh, Kabbalists of the the early modern period, Renaissance, Pico della Mirandola, Reuschlin, uh, Ficino, they uh, they saw something there. You know, they they, they recognized something that was uh, sympathetic, or resonant of of Christian uh, philosophy and theology. Um, so another thing I want to talk about, and also in, in, with these with these these sets of fours, he, he connects it to the the tetragrammaton, the the, the four letters of, of the name of God in Hebrew, Yohei Um So he's so this is Hermetic philosophy, and this is a very a traditional. Uh, approach to hermetic philosophy. It's, you know, this is something you would find throughout the Renaissance in so many different sources. They always connect it and they're always trying to figure out a system that, that corresponds to this. And to Tom Burke's credit, he, he, if you'll notice, he pays homage to, to that tradition, but he also brings his own creativeness to explicating new things. And, and he brings in this is why I think it's such a re remarkable book. He brings in uh, things that are going on today and or in, during his day in science, philosophy, and theology. He talks about uh, Teilhard de Chardin, for instance, or the discoveries of, of scientists at his time, or nuclear energy, or uh, w nuclear war. You know, he so he, it doesn't. It's not a stagnant uh, kind of romantic throwback. He's keeping the tradition alive, and he's and, and the thing is, with keeping the tradition alive, means you're always bringing something new to it. You know, so in a way, I'm bringing something new to it, and not just me, but anybody who's using the internet to present these ideas, or, or even you know, using the internet uh, 
as is analogous to whatever kind of kinds of things we might talk about in relationship to this tradition. Or or quantum quantum mechanics is probably a, a really good one. You know, because I think uh, there's a lot of lot lot to be explored there as far as consciousness and hermetic philosophy. Um, <clears throat> now, one thing I wanted to talk about, though, to, before we finish, is he go back, going back to this idea of Sophia, which he, which he initiates in his epigraph. He, he implies in the idea of gendered typology and, and in Sophiology, um, it's Proverbs 8, even more than Proverbs 9, that, that explicates that when uh, Sophia speaks and says, I was with, with him at the beginning of all things. I found, you know, he was help, she was she was with God at the creation, helping him. This is help me, right? And that gendered typology is so important and so lost in so many quarters of the church and of Christianity in general. It's lost. And Tomberg is bringing it back, back in the 60s. And he talks on page 45, so it's getting toward the end of the, of the chapter. He's talking about the, the empress's position as seated. It is necessary to be seated, that is, to establish an active passive state of consciousness or state of soul which listens attentively in silence. It is necessary to be woman, that is, to be in the state of silent expectation and not in that of the activity which talks. Again, affirmation of the contemplative stance, being present. But also, what he evokes here is the image of Pentecost. Now, in uh, some Orth Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Catholic icons of Pentecost, Mary is usually at the center. So the apostles are in a circle around her, and she's there. I always think of her as as the lightning rod, as the receptor, right? Because she was present uh, at the birth, right? At the incarnation, at the at the annunciation, her presence. You know, and she and not not just there, but but she was necessary to the incarnation. And here, she's necessary to the bestowal of the Holy Spirit. Just like as Sophia. She's present with God at the creation of everything. This is super important. Um, and also, she's present at the beatific vision, at least according to Dante. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll end with, a, I'm going to read a, the, the end of the Paradiso. Canto 33 starts with St. Bernard's uh, Prayer to the Holy Virgin. Because he brings Dante, if you haven't read it, you know, all the way through hell, through purgatory, and now all the way through the heavenly realms. And then you're at, you're at, you're at the threshold of the beatific vision. And what do you see first? Mary. And here's, here's the St. Bernard's Prayer. And this is from, uh, I think it's Dorothy Sayers' translation, which isn't too bad. I, I didn't think I liked it before, but <laughs> it's not too bad. O Virgin Mother, daughter of thy Son, lowliest and loftiest of created stature, fixed goal to which the eternal counsels run. Thou art that she by whom our human nature was so ennobled that it might become the creator to create himself his creature. Thy sides were made a shelter to to relume the love whose warmth within the timeless peace quicken the seed of, of this immortal bloom. High noon of charity to those in bliss and upon earth to men in mortal plight, a living spring of hope thy presence is. Lady, so great thou art and such thy might, the seeker after grace who shuns thy knee may aim his prayer but fails to wing the flight. Not only does thy succor flow out free to him who asks, but many a time the aid foreruns the prayer, such largesse is in thee. 
All truth, all mercy are in thee displayed, and all munificence. In thee is knit together all that's good and all that's made. I used to say that prayer in actually John Chiardi's translation almost every day. Uh, beautiful prayer. Now this happens at the beginning here, and then, then Dante experiences the beatific vision, which is, you know, can only be spoken of in terms of of light and abstractions. But I love the way that ends, and I think everybody does. And then here at the very end of the poem, high fantasy lost power and here broke off. Yet as wheel moves smoothly, free from jars, my will and my desire were turned by love, the love that moves the sun and the other stars. And here, I, mean, I uh, Tom Berg would agree with Dante, because he saw Dante at the beginning of letter two to the, talks about, you know, which is superior, ontology or love. And for a Christian, it can only be love. And as much as I love Martin Heidegger, as much as I appreciate ontology, because I think ontology is important. You have to know what things are, what, what, what being is. But being doesn't have any meaning without love, which is what both Dante told us and what Valentin Tomberg told us. And so, see you next time.